Aloha and welcome to What's Bugging You, brought to you by Hawaii's leader in pest control and the first company in Hawaii to earn the National Quality Pro Certification, Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. Now, here's the host of our show, Mike Buck. Uh, welcome back, and, and it's so nice to have you with us. Uh, the the show, what's bugging you? Uh, some of you know it's been on hiatus for a while. Well, we're back, and we're back primarily uh, because the uh, the the founder and president of San Rafael Pest Solutions has figured out a way uh, to manage his time more properly, and more importantly than that, open up the uh, party so that we can in, invite you to learn some more about the company and about some of the folks that are in it today. Very very topical. Uh, as you know, that we've had in the news, um, uh, dengue uh, on the Big Island, the dengue fever, and now this Zika virus. It, it's it's not. It, it is such a coincidence that uh, that we are able to introduce you uh, to Doctor uh, uh, Marissa Quintanilla and or Quintanilla, if you want to, in English. She is an entomologist. She's also a uh, she's a certified entomologist and also the director of training at at Sandwich Isle and is a uh, she's from Michigan. Uh, that's where she got her PhD. But you'll find out sh- very cor- soon she's not from Michigan. She's from Chile. Aloha. <laughs> What you know? This is so interesting, Marisol. We met the other day out of the, out of the office, and I was so kind of surprised to find out what a route you took to get to Hawaii. I think people should know. How did you go from your country in South America to come to Hawaii? Okay. Well, um, my my family owns a grape farm in Chile. I started studying agronomy, mm-hmm. agriculture, engineering in my country. I decided I wanted to finish my studies in the United States, so I did my last year of undergrad in Andrews University, Berrien Springs, Michigan. From there, I was invited, I was um, requested to do a master's um, with an uh, an assistantship at Mm -hmm. Michigan State University, and So they were really well-traveled. Yes, I... When you say say in your country, uh, how old were you the first time you left Chile? The first time I left Chile, I must have been maybe 12 or 13, and we went for a vacation to Florida, to Miami. That was Mm. my first time out of my country, and that's when Mm. the first time I knew what hot was. Okay, yeah, really. (laughs) And now you're here, now you only know what hot is, you know what humid is. Um, How similar are the climates to, to home? Um. Well, not so similar. Um, in my country, it's a it's a lot drier, at least in the central region where I'm from. Uh, it's maybe it's more similar to southern southern and central California, um, but a lot of the crops we grow are can be grown here, like avocados mm-hmm. and oranges. But the the weather is more like you, and you have an awful lot of land there too that we don't have as much land as you all do huh uh, <laughs> yes it, but interestingly enough i mean what what got you here um you know uh, you're doing some you know you're you're doing some teaching at university of hawaii but also you know many people know that michael botha from sandwich isle is from south africa originally and it sort of makes the company even more of an international company and 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 yet it's interesting because he is one of the leaders in the business. So t- talk a little bit about how you and he met and then how you decided to become a part of Sandwich Isles. Okay. Well, um, I worked at the University of Hawaii. I actually didn't teach. I was doing research. I was um, a research faculty. Mm-hmm. And what, what, so what were you researching? Well, my, I did a couple of research projects. Mm-hmm. One of them was on green onions, uh, finding sustainable okay. management practices for green onion pests and diseases. Mm-hmm. And another one was on tomatoes, uh, also finding sustainable management practices for s- tomato um, pests and, and, and some viral diseases. You know, I know we could spend literally a whole show talking about chemicals and pesticides and things. Uh, it's pretty interesting. There's been a big shift in, in a lot of that, hasn't there? In in studies like you're talking about, what works and yet and what is friendly to the environment and friendly to the planet. That's right. Yeah, we yeah. we want to get that balance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that what works and it's also friendly to the environment and the planet. I know a little something about Marisol that you don't know, but you're going to find out in a minute. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of things today. Um, and our pests in the news section, uh, which is is fascinating because we've been under the um, sort of, you know, the learning curve of dengue for quite a while because of this outbreak of dengue. Uh, and Marisol, you know a lot about dengue. 
Yes. You had it. I had dengue in 1987 <laughs> wow. in Brazil. Okay, yeah. so I, I want to play you a little something uh, that we heard on CNN the other day because isn't it sort of interesting? Uh, you, you, you can explain as the entomologist in the, in the room. Um, the dengue virus, the dengue fever, and the Zika virus are this carried by the same mosquito? It's carried by the same mosquito, yeah. yes, Aedes. It's the one that looks like a zebra, black and white striped mosquito. Wow. And it can bite you during the day. Okay, and what about at night? We'll find out about that, and we'll find out some other things. But first of all, I want you to listen to this as part of our, our news segment. Uh, in the news, this is from CNN. This is a little primer, if you will, about the Zika virus. Here's what we know about Zika. Some of it will frighten you, but maybe not as much as you think. It's a mosquito-borne virus, part of the same family as yellow fever, West Nile, chikungunya, and dengue. As things stand now, there is no vaccine to prevent Zika or a medicine to treat the infection. The most common symptoms include fever, rash, headaches, and red eyes. But 80% of people who get Zika won't even know they have it. That's right, there are only symptoms in one in five people. Now the virus is spreading quickly across Central and South America and the Caribbean. What makes Zika so scary is this alarming connection between the virus and microcephaly. That is babies being born with heads and brains that are too small. In Brazil and several other Latin American countries, they've become concerned enough they've asked women there not to get pregnant. In the United States, pregnant women are being told to postpone travel to any of these countries. In case you're curious, this is the bloodsucker everyone's after, the female Aedes aegypti. She's an aggressive biter that, unlike other mosquitoes, feeds mostly during the day. For example, she's different than the mosquitoes that transmit malaria who like to feed at night. That's important because bed nets won't help as much here. The best way to prevent infections is using insect repellent with DEET, wearing thick long sleeve shirts and long pants and staying inside in screened air conditioned areas as much as possible. Now, there you go. That was a CNN report, and, and it's it's sort of interesting, uh, Marisol, um, how, how topical that is. Did you agree with most of what they were talking about? Yes, I, mm-hmm. I, I agree. I mm-hmm. agree. Um, it's, Zika is very similar to, to dengue. It's a very mm-hmm. similar virus, and it's transmitted by the same mosquito. Yeah, and it's very interesting that you said just before that, that report, uh, it, there there's nighttime mosquitoes and there's daytime mosquitoes is this dengue mosquito and the zika mosquito a daytime or nighttime well it 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 can feed in the day it Mm. likes shady areas so it won't feed on you when you are out in the sun Mm -hmm. um but in sherry and under trees or in your house it will feed on you in the day early in the morning and in the evening it, it it has mm-hmm. a greater greater activity. Okay, now, interestingly enough, when I met Marisol the other day, um, not only is she a PhD, but she's a victim. She actually got the dengue, and it's so timely that we talk about this because we've talked to some others, but because you are a professional, uh, first of all, how did you get it? How did you, uh, uh, how did you contract the disease? Well, <laughs> I was in Mato Grosso, Brazil, okay. and I was helping to, I was a volunteer to remove Africanized bees okay from, so you're working on bees right i was yeah, i was yeah. removing bees nests that were actually biting people and some people had died in those areas wow. so i was i was volunteering to do this and i got thousands of bites in the i mean stings in the uh, thousands and bee stings in the process but um during that time it started el nino in, in 1997 mm-hmm. very severe floods um in south america floods mean mosquitoes right yes yeah. and um the water started um Water levels started rising. Mosquito levels started rising, and I remember being bit, being um, bit by hundreds of mm. black and white striped mosquitoes. So eighties oh mosquitoes, mm-hmm. um, and I got dengue along with most of the people I was with. Okay, now when you say you got dengue, there's different kinds of dengue, yes. and some of the things we try to warn people about. And I asked about multiple, you know, exposures. Um, what what type of dengue did you get? What what was? Well, I I don't know. I don't mm. know what what serotype they, I got. I, there's four. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, I did not even go to the doctor because at the time when I got dengue, um, I had to travel to my country. And before I got dengue, I mean, I was already probably infected, but um, 
I had to travel from from Brazil to Chile, mm-hmm. and I traveled through Bolivia in a bus. And there was floods uh, because of the, I mean, started the El Nino thing, floods, the roads shut, there was landslides. I was stuck in the and middle of the jungle for weeks, mm-hmm. you know, with no food. I mean, just trying to eat out of the jungle as the natives mm-hmm. help, you know, water collect from the rain. So I did not have any chance to get medical attention or to find out what kind of dengue I got. But I know I had dengue. Are we right in Hawaii to be concerned about this? Right now, it's been pretty much, uh, it, you know, contained on the Big Island. Uh, the one case that we did have on Oahu was somebody that had been traveling to some place where there was dengue. But I'm more worried about now. I think we're getting aware of the dengue, but I, I think how how much more serious is Zika than dengue? Well, Zika is actually not more serious than dengue. Mm. If you get Zika, the the symptoms are much milder. Ah. No, dengue is called breakbone fever. Oh, yeah, you know it what? Hurts. We never did go through that. We skipped over the part. Okay, you got the dengue. We didn't know what kind. And even though you're in a, in, in a remote area, nothing to eat, nothing to drink, How? and you're in good physical shape, how did it affect you physically? Uh, terrible, terrible pain. Mm-hmm. I could what hardly of, move. Where was the pain? The joints. Okay. In yeah. my joints, mm-hmm. muscles. Um, terrible pain, very, very high fever, and... A lot of the people I was with also got it, and I was the one that it was doing the best. There were some people actually that were um, lost consciousness and were were doing much yeah. worse than I that I had to take care of. And wow. it, it it was probably a combination of having dengue mm. and also you know lack of proper water and food. Mm-hmm. I mean, we were. Stuck in the middle of the jungles, you know, because of floods and cut bridges and landslides. That's so why the it was a combination. Part, right? Well, the oh. break bone is that's that's dengue. Yeah, dengue yeah. is the break bone fever. It 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 really hurts the joints. So Zika is much sm- milder, but Zika comes with a twist mm-hmm. because um, Zika can af. It, it, it is suspected now mm-hmm. that it could increase the chances of a, a baby getting microcephaly. Yeah, which is very, very scary, isn't it? Yes, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, uh, the baby would be handicapped for life mm-hmm. with you know, mental retardation. And it, it's, it's a very difficult thing. I'm, um, to, it's a very difficult burden for, for, for the parents. I know there's no panacea, but let's talk about now. Let's put your other hat on now. And you do the training and the work at Sandwich Isle to help people. And right now I do know that, you know, uh, Michael gave, both gave me uh, advice weeks ago to get rid of my bromeliads, turn them upside down, get the water out of them. Uh, let's talk about how you're affecting the training because you're involved in the, in, you're in charge of the training of people. Are you finding more people are concerned to the point where they want to call up and they want to make an appointment for somebody to come and and survey their property, find out if they have mosquitoes, and then treat them? Oh, for sure. The number of people concerned about mosquitoes has increased. Mm-hmm. Um, what you need to do? Well, you... Call Sandwich Isles. Yeah, four <laughs> but, five six seven seven one six or sandwichisles.com. But, but we'll besides, tell you about that again later. Besides yeah. that, mm-hmm. you need to make sure that there's no standing water in your property. Mm-hmm. Turn over all plant pots that are con- uh, uh, buckets, mm-hmm. um, tires. You know, tires accumulate That's water in yeah. between, and there's mosquito larva in there. Mm-hmm. Mosquitoes. The, the, the adults, actually just the female, feed on blood. The larvae live in the water. Mm-hmm. The, and so managing standing water is the number one steps you can you can take. Well, having screens in your house, mm-hmm. using repellent when you're outdoors in an area that has mosquitoes, are other steps that you can take. By the way, in dengue, the first time you get it, the, the chances of mortality are low. But if you get it, uh, by a different serotype, mm-hmm. you get a, a, a second time or third time with a different serotype. Your chances of getting hemorrhagic dengue fever are 
are much higher. And hemorrhagic dengue fever does have a high mortality rate. I think the Center for Disease Control, the Department of Health, they've done a pretty good job. Uh, we're seeing a lot more educational stuff out there. But you at Sandwich Isles are actually the ones with the boots on the ground. Yes. Uh, and now when you talk about training these people and, and, and making sure that, that they do that, what sort of treatment can, can a homeowner expect Sandwich Isles to do for them outside of just dumping the water? What do you, what do you look for and then how do you treat it? Well, one of the first steps we take is actually inspecting the area and look for standing water Mm -hmm. and remove that, pour that out. Other steps is um, applying um, insecticides, larvicides, to bromeliads. Bromeliads collect water and mosquitoes um, lay eggs Mm -hmm. in that water in bromeliad plants. Um, Do you, you, can you, is it a one... Visit fix in in many cases. Can you go out and say triage a piece of property and 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 do the things that need to get done for the homeowner in one trip? Oh yes, so we can do. Um, then after we also do fogging, mm-hmm. and fogging kills the adults. Okay, but it is not a one time fix in that we come one time and you'll yeah, never yeah. have mosquitoes in your life. Yeah, that's why we talk about it, management. But I think it's exciting that I learned from you and and I think we should share. And that is that uh, what, what has to happen on this thing is, it's like Michael says in the termite commercials, there's two kinds of houses in Hawaii, right? Those with termites and those that are going to get termites. <laughs> yes. and, and, and I think that's, it's cute and everything, but I also think the message is that you re- have to realize, look, there is no panacea. You need to manage your, your property. You need to be aggressive and proactive. For sure. No, our, our, our treatments are very effective. But if we are not treating the neighbor's house, if we are not yeah. treating the neighboring pond, there will be new mosquitoes coming there. So in general, um, these kind of situations need monthly or quarterly follow-ups if you mm-hmm. want to make sure that you are mosquito-free. Yeah, and that's why it's, it's called management and control and solutions. I think that's also interesting, I learned from you, that mosquitoes, they're not traveling miles and miles. They, they have relatively small area, and, and is there anything that you can tell us about how long they live? I mean, they must rapidly, rapidly reproduce when there's water available, but yes. how long do they live? Um, not, not very long. They have a short, short lifespan, just, just a few days. Yeah. Um, it, it not, not, not a long time, but they are able to have a great number of offspring. They can multiply mm. quickly. If there is, if there's standing water, you can quickly have a mosquito, um, a high mosquito population. Oh boy. Now th- th- that's funny. Cause only a few days. Are there any good things about mosquitoes? I mean, wh- why are they here? I mean, do they are they do they feed other pl- things? What what's their place in the whole thing? Okay, well, I first want to tell you the bad thing. Mm. Mosquitoes are the most dangerous animal on the planet. See, that they is kill so scary. more people yeah. than any other animal. Mm-hmm. Um, in the past, they killed millions, but because of m- better malaria treatment, now they kill nearly a million a year. Mm-hmm. Human wow. beings, human beings kill about half of that. Rodents are also um, very dangerous, but mosquitoes are without competition number one killer of human beings because of the this the terrible diseases that they that they um vector to people okay and when we talk about that and vectoring and all of this we we talk about invasive things we talk about awful things today you're getting two for the price of one not only your doctor uh kid today and i talking about the mosquitoes but also she mentioned just briefly their rodents and that's going to be part of our program today too we're glad you're listening it's sandwich Isle pest solutions the program is called what's bugging you and it won't be bugging you if you take control and listen to this why do you need termite protection My home is very important to me. Your home is your castle. My home is everything to me. Our customers want to protect their investment. That's why they hire Sandwich Isle to protect their home from termites. There are some homes out there that are going to get termites. You can spend thousands and thousands of dollars to repair damage. You need to protect your house, and Sandwich Isle protects ours. That's Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. Expect more and get it. Now it's more of what's bugging.
bugging you. That's the Anska marching in, whether you like it or not. And it's sort of interesting because, you know, when you think about a pest control uh, company here in Hawaii, it used to be only uh, mosquitoes. Everybody's worried about mosquitoes. I mean, I'm sorry, termites. Everybody's about worried, eating their house. But now it, it dawns us, and we can talk because Dr. Uh, Marisol Quintanilla is an entomologist, certified board entomologist. Director of training is what her job is there. And we just found out um, – that the mosquito, the lowly little mosquito that only lives for a couple of days, is probably the biggest threat on the planet. Isn't that yes, scary? Yes, it's the most dangerous animal yeah. on the planet. And it's such a little thing. And <laughs> only it's here for a while. Uh, what can one expect uh, as far as we talk about being proactive, you know, and... Uh, and we are. That music was going on too loud underneath. The, sorry about that. Anyway, it's sort of interesting to me that, first of all, I bet a lot of people don't know, approximately how many different types of mosquitoes do we have in Hawaii? Well, for, for the ones that transmit diseases and that are dangerous, you know, the Anopheles and the Aedes mm-hmm. are, are the most common. Okay. You know, the Anopheles can trans, uh, vector malaria. And the Aedes, you know, um, Zika and Dengue. There's other types. Most mosquitoes that are here are not native. They have they have been brought mm-hmm. in um, with migration of peoples throughout the years. You know, I know that's a big concern, and you talked about that. I mean, coming from your from your country, your home of Chile, South America is a literally a hotbed of every kind of thing because it's such a huge piece of real estate. Yes, uh, a lot of we, biodiversity in South America. Yeah, and, and how do we uh, protect a little place like Hawaii from travelers or from uh, imports, from fruits and vegetables, from all of the kind of things? It's, you, like you say, none of these things are native. They've all been brought in somehow. Sadly, yeah. the good things have come with the bad things. Mm-hmm. Um, in the past... In the far distant past, there was no control of what came in in mm. Hawaii. Yeah. Um, people would bring plants, soil, and animals. Um, but time, as people realize the ter- terrible effects mm-hmm. that some animals can produce, that can, uh, like rodents, etc., yeah. there has been greater control. And that is the function of USDA APHIS. But we can all play a part in this by mm. not bringing or smuggling things yeah very plants, important soil yeah. fruits even Big. little animals i mean you know even though it's slightly outside of your purview i mean we're going to talk about rodents here in a minute because of the pest control that you do at san Rosal, but even little things like a, a certain kind of a gecko or or something that doesn't belong here if they start eating native things and then they become a problem we, there's no solution yeah, it it just brings it, it mm. just messes up the balance, the mm. ecosystem mm. balance. Are and you happy? A little happier? Are people in your profession, uh, those of you that are PhDs, um, that that states and governments are more likely now to listen to facts and figures, particularly when you can show what causes what and maybe act on it? Oh, for sure. Mm. Um, uh, uh, the U.S. government, USDA, AFIS, and other organizations are extremely receptive and they're proactive. They are the ones initiating mm-hmm. um, pre- quarantines. And I know a lot of people feel awful. Oh, my dog's got to be in quarantine for so long. Let's talk about that for just a second. We have no rabies in Hawaii. Do you want the rabies in Absolutely Hawaii? Absolutely not. So, so yeah, you know, yeah. just just think mm-hmm. all these quarantine measures are for the benefit of of all of us and the united states is in part a great country Mm -hmm. because of organization and laws that are enforced and are obeyed um that's what makes the united states great and we do not want this country to not be this way you know it's sort of interesting because just before the break we were talking about i was asking about and and you're you know now that you gave up these alarming statistics of how much problems mosquitoes cost my still the other question still was though is outside of your pond fish that can can help control mosquitoes by having these little guppies and things in your in your water plants are they of benefit to anything i mean uh, why do we even have them and can't we just get rid of them all or who do, who benefits from them? does it does anybody eat them who eats mosquitoes well mosquitoes are an important part of the food chain a lot of a lot of fish and mm-hmm. um, aquatic insects etc feed on mosquito larvae mm-hmm. so they're they're an important it's all protein right the larva <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah high protein yeah, yeah. and so 
Yes, but you know, th most of these mosquitoes are not native to Hawaii, so I would say getting rid of them um, will probably not cause a, a, a very a, gr a great ecological yeah. disaster, um, except on those a on those animals that have become adapted on on, on feeding on sure, feeding on them, needing that on needing yeah. them. Um, Somebody <laughs> asked about: Do birds eat mosquitoes? You know, I mean, is there? I mean, you know, sure, sure, mm. bats and mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. There's okay. Since you brought up, since you said that word, bats, let's let's put on a different hat today because we want to. We're actually trying to cover two areas: more on the on the Zika virus and the dengue mosquito. But one of the big, big things that you do at Sandwich Isle, I know, is help restaurants, buildings, and homeowners on rat control and rat and and rodent control. Huge problem in Hawaii. F f Are tremendous you and and we have tremendous. some big ones. Yes, yeah. The the biggest commensal rat, you know, that associated with human dwellings, is the Norway rat, and mm -hmm. they are they are very large, and and rodents, they are just partners with mosquitoes. They're also among the most dangerous animals on the earth. They what, eat what, okay, the. Okay, wait, wait. We know that we know that you know in a in a mosquito for dengue and for Zika and all of these other things, malaria, you're going to get bitten. Uh, do you need to get bitten by a rat to get sick from it? Or no. It, ah, what's the problem? <laughs> well, rats, well, mm. first of all, they feed on about 20% of the human food. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they consume about 20% of the food. So they are just a danger to us just plainly because yeah, yeah. How do we they endanger ourselves? our food security. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, another thing is that some rat rodent diseases can be vectored through their fleas like mm -hmm. happened in the uh, Black Plague during the Middle Ages that killed about one-third of Europe populations. I mean, mm -hmm. millions and millions and millions mm -hmm. of people. There wasn't, you couldn't even bury them as fast yeah. enough as they were dying. So, yes, um, and rodents transmit some viral diseases that you can get, like antivirus, that you can get from the um, urine. Mm -hmm. And just inhalation is enough, just smelling um, their, their urine. You, uh, uh, some of the diseases can be transferred through yeah. feces, you know, that, urine. Yeah, I, I, you know, if you go into a, a place that is, is unpopulated for a long time that, that rodents have taken over, I know it. it you, you can actually smell them. I know, and some of your field guys and some and all of the people that you train, they must be aware of, wow, I think that's rats. And, yeah. and sometimes a homeowner, they might hear a little scratching here and there, but they never see them. Yeah, well... <laughs> rodents are a little bit like ninjas you yeah, know they, yeah, they, yeah. They, they want to stay away from our they, they, they don't want us to see them because they know exactly what we're going to do to them if we see them so do you get surprised at how aggressive they are with regards to getting into things for instance uh i have this huge big hard plastic container with the o-ring and everything for dog food and they ate right through it they ate right through it i had to go buy a new one well their teeth yeah their teeth are pretty much as hard as a stainless steel knife blade yeah they can they a plastic container for them is nothing no, to no chew problem. on yeah. no they, they can they can they can chew and their teeth are constantly growing so as it as they know on things they just keep on growing and just mm -hmm. make them just make their teeth sharper <laughs> you know it's it's kind of scary because i do know that a lot of what sandwich isle does is you you have you know, the majority of the business is certainly uh, the residential business and the, and the termite and pest control. But what about the the exercises you have to do to get rid of larger things like rodents and, and particularly in restaurants and in buildings where they have a mandate to be rodent free? Well, um, we use uh, on the exterior, we use rodent baits. Mm -hmm. We use very effective rodent baits that are anticoagulant, second generation anticoagulants. Explain that. Um, <laughs> well, and they. You're the doctor. I'm the patient. Explain that. <laughs> well, and anticoagulants they 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 block the production of vitamin K, and vitamin K helps to coagulate the blood. Mm -hmm. So since they it stops the production the, of vitamin K, they slowly run out of vitamin K. So they don't die in one day. They die in a few days. And that's a good thing because mm -hmm. if they died immediately, the other rodents will figure it out. They mm -hmm. see their friend Joe. He fed on that food and then he fell dead a few minutes later. None yeah, of them will feed on yeah. that again. 
So, but you know what, though, I, I must tell you uh, that I, I have a feeling that people have an, a hard time explaining, understanding the reason for that. In other words, they want a knee jerk, come out and kill them all right today. I, I want all my rats to be gone. You have to be a little bit patient in, in, in this, from what it sounds. Well, yeah, well, but, but this bait. You 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 have to be patient because if the rodent dies immediately, you will have one rodent dead, but the rest are all going to be alive. Yeah. So they they need to not figure out that the food is poisonous, and that way they need to die slowly. But inside, um, we need to put uh, many different types of mm-hmm. traps. There's some glue traps that work very well for small mice. Mice for large rats, they can get out. They they're strong yeah. enough to get out of the glue trap. But there's also other traps that work for rats. Rats are a little bit more difficult to trap because they are trap weary. They, they 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 are afraid of traps, mm-hmm. so they have to get used to it. Sometimes we have to put a bait that is not poison just for them to feed on it and get used to it, and then put mass trappings mm-hmm. and to to catch a large population. You know, it's sort of interesting because uh, when I when I met uh, Dr. Quintanilla uh, the other day out at uh, Sandwich Isles, one of the things that we we talked about immediately uh, were the, were the main gist of what Sandwich Isles does and in this management, particularly of termites and other things. But what I think is really interesting to me is the opportunities in your field i mean you're an entomologist so obviously you're in high demand but i'm just talking about the opportunities that exist at sandwich island i know that you're involved in the training it is a very honorable profession isn't it when you know what you're doing and you're doing it safely the reaction you get from homeowners when you've solved the problem for them must be terrific you know actually i would equivalent this profession as being a superhero yeah because if it wasn't for people that are controlling pests. If it wasn't for companies like Sandwich Childs, we would be, we would have people dying of malaria. Yeah. We would have dengue. We will have the plague. We would, we would have thousands of people of dying of rodent, uh, you know, of, of rodent vector diseases, of, 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 of mosquito vector diseases. You would be living with pests and disease. Mm-hmm. I mean, life would be very different. So b- b- sanitation and pest control is what makes our lifestyle possible. Yeah, that's really interesting. I know that, that Michael often, Michael both of the owner and founder of, of Sandwich Isles, often says on the program when we've done shows together before, talks about, look, cleanliness and removing the food source are the biggest things you can yes, do. Yes, for sure, the you most know? important. Yeah, and, and particularly in kids' rooms. If you allow them to eat in their rooms or eat in their bedrooms, you're gonna, there's a food chain that starts in, in the bedroom, right, which is a pretty good, uh, bad idea. What about sort of interesting, I know you heard about this when you first got here. Um, a long time ago, somebody felt wisdom in, we had a big rat problem from ships and from whatever and from the ag field. So they thought, well, we're going to bring these animals over here that are going to kill all these rats. They're called mongoose. <laughs> and what? why didn't it work? I mean, what's the difference between a mongoose and a rat and their living habits? Well, um, some of these rodents are really large, mm-hmm. like. Um, Norway rats, etc. Some the of way, these. When you say really large, how how, how large? Like are about talking? a pound. Yeah. Like Pretty about a size. pound yeah. in, in weight. Yeah. Um. And and a lot of these rodents, like roof rats, mm-hmm. are arboreal. They're walking on the trees and on the roofs, and they don't really come in contact with some of these mongooses. Which are on the ground. Yeah. Primarily. So. Yeah. Um, I am sure they have eaten some rodents, but mm-hmm. it wasn't the. It wasn't the. It didn't. It, it wasn't the fix. It See, wasn't somebody, the fix. Somebody once told us. Well, one of the problems was some of them eat during the daytime and some of them eat during the nighttime. And unfortunately, the main mongoose and the main rats don't feed at the same time, or they're not wandering around at the same time. But then they become a problem. So now we got a mongoose issue. What do we do about mongoose? <laughs> I, you know, I, we. They can be trapped. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think I maybe, know. and when you say trapped, I want to tell you another thing. I was blown away several programs ago with Michael Botha 
the the amount of feral pigs and things that are being managed. And yeah. I mean, so at, at Sandwich Isle, you can go from this tiny little uh, microscopic, almost uh, a bed bug, which is another thing we haven't talked about yet. Yeah, well, all bed bugs w- are like the size of an apple seed. Yeah, yeah. Exa- isn't that interesting? Yeah. And all of a sudden, we go up to something as big as a feral pig. So yeah. I guess I, that's why I say, when you say that people are superheroes, people that get into this business, it can be quite rewarding. Uh, for sure, and it, it, it gives a lot of intellectual satisfaction. Mm-hmm. Um, people are getting trained, they're having classes, they get Department of Agriculture certifications. It's like going to college. Yeah, and, and that being said, what, do you, what are you still doing on a, on a regular basis at University of Hawaii? Because you did your research there. What, what sort of umbilical do you still have there? Well, right now I'm in a non-compensated research faculty, mm-hmm. so I still have access to the uni- um, the university's yeah. research facilities and libraries, and I'm still active with some research projects in University of Hawaii. Are, are we uh, a, a good place in Hawaii to do some of the research that's being done that can benefit other locales? I mean, uh, for you know, sure. Yeah, I, I'm guessing the answer's got to be yes. Yep, um, Hawaii is like the big brother of all the other U.S. Pacific islands. Mm-hmm. I mean, even uh, islands that are not in the U.S. The research done here is then extended or used by other Pacific islands. Besides, Hawaii is it's one of the it's one of the only it's uh, agri- um, tropical areas in mm-hmm. the United States. So the research done in Hawaii is very applicable to very needy tropical areas in yeah. Latin, in South America, in Africa, in Asia, you know, tropical Asia, etc. So our research is very applicable and it just coincides that most of these tropical countries do not have very good solutions to their problems and they do not have much research. So the University of Hawaii research is very, very, yeah. very valuable. You know, as we search around for more things, I do know that there's this big ongoing controversy between the, you know, the seed manufacturers and the pesticide manufacturers. And I do know that those of you at Sandwich Isle and other companies really have to keep an eye on the chemicals, what's permitted and what's not permitted. Uh, are we testing some things in Hawaii that have use outside of Hawaii? Oh, for sure. I mean, the, the products that are tested in Hawaii have use and will be used outside of Hawaii. In fact, the, the, the chemical of Centricone was in, 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 in part um, discovered here in Hawaii. A lot of products, a lot of experiments that start here in Hawaii um, end up having um, use in other yeah. Pacific islands and sometimes worldwide use. You're going to find out in a minute or two about some other things. Uh, our mailbag this week is is kind of interesting. Uh, we're going to talk about fire ants. I know that we're primarily talking about mosquitoes and rodents, and we're going to continue that conversation. But I want you to understand, uh, if you need to know more about any of the things that we're talking about, and you want to get a better idea of the length and breadth of what Sandwich Isle does, two ways to do this. Uh, to make an appointment or to talk to somebody about a problem or maybe get some advice, call them up uh, here on Oahu at uh, 456-7716. That's 456-7716. Or easier yet, go to www.sandwichisle.com. It's a great website, a lot of interaction stuff. You, you hear from a lot of uh, you know non-actors. These are people with real testimonials to give. And it's all about controlling stuff, whether they be like what we're talking about today, mosquitoes or rodents. Uh, what about fire ants? What about black ants? What about moths? What about all of this other stuff? You're going to find out more about that uh, when we come back. Simply put, right? Simply put, if we cannot solve your pest problem, we'll keep coming back at no additional cost until you are completely satisfied. And if, for any reason, you're not completely satisfied, we'll refund your last payment, no questions asked. Remember, pests can no longer be considered simply a nuisance. Keeping pests out of your home is critical for your health and the health of your family. Don't settle for anything less than the best. That's Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. Expect more and get it. Oh yeah, we got all of these birds and bees in the background. It's sort of sandwich oil music. You know, one of the things, one of the new, uh, the I, I guess, 
trademarks at Sandwich Isle is you can expect more and get it. And that's one of the main reasons why I want to let you know. Uh, Dr. Marisol uh, Quintanilla uh, is a certified board entomologist and a recent addition to the growing staff at Sandwich Isle. And I guess... Um, if, if, if people could just realize, Marisol, what a field that you're in and what a service is needed, it doesn't seem to me like it's a job that's ever going to be done. In other words, as long as we're on the planet, there's going to be problems. And one of the things that I think is important, not only is a career opportunity, because I do know that you guys are expanding, you always have opportunities. What's the best way to hook up and find out what kind of jobs are out there and how to apply for one? And then what to expect as far as being trained if you don't know anything about it but want to learn? Okay. Um, well, there's the there's several uh, positions available mm -hmm. at Sandwich Isle at the moment. Um, some of these positions can be found in Indeed, mm -hmm. and s also you can go to Sandwich Isle website. You can call the number. Yep. That four that five six seven seven one six. That's right. And it, speak you know, to I, I found out this. It, it, it's continually recruiting, uh, and it's recruiting because lots and lots of your people uh, l come in at an entry level, learn other things, move into a different department, take on bigger responsibilities. So that's always creating a, a need for new people to, to learn about this business. That's right. As people are getting are, are trained, as they get certifications, they move mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. Um, they move into manager positions, etc. And also, we are expanding. So we constantly need more techs. The uh, Sandra Charles Pest Solution is one of the fastest growing pest control companies in the United States. Yeah, that's really interesting. And as a, as a result of that, we have the, ben the benefit of having uh, Marisol here because Michael Botha is, boy, he has great time management because this guy is literally on demand uh, nationally. And it is sort of interesting, too. And we can blow his horn a little bit because he's not here. Yes. The national recognition that San Rochelle get is must be very rewarding to people in management like yourself to know yes. that you're at a company that people realize how valuable it is yes yeah uh and that's why that expect more you can get it that there's a really good guarantee let's talk a little bit about the uh i told you in the mailbag today and we we get questions asked a lot by email and by snail mail and everything else um we hear a lot about fire ants uh and i mean do we have an, a native fire ant or, or, or should we be concerned are we importing them what what, what are fire ants well, the red imported fire ant is not yet a problem in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. We have the little fire ant, and that is a problem in the Big Island yeah. and in other areas. Um, but the University of Hawaii is doing a great job with it. There's some, um, a researcher called Cass Vanderwood who has dedicated his life mm -hmm. to um, little fire ants. Um, it's amazing, isn't it, what some of you d choose to specialize in? Yes. You know, I wonder if he said, why do you want fire ants? Well, because there's a problem. He wants to be part of the solution. Oh, yes, yeah. of course. And, uh, uh, <laughs> definitely dedicated mm -hmm. his life to controlling yeah, them, not, yeah. to, not yeah. to multiply them. Yeah. It, but but I still think it's sort of interesting because there's a lot of things that we talk about here that we have or we don't have, and I think it's a, it's a pretty fine balance. So th that's why I want to get back to uh, a thing that we talk about a fair bit, and that is... Uh, with regards to rodent control or rodent handling, I know that people are embarrassed to even say that they have rats and they feel like they've caused it. What causes a rat to come into a home? Because aren't they really more comfortable outside? Well, there's mice. Mm -hmm. They can the rodent mice can live inside in, in your house. And uh, by the be way, born and die there. Yeah, we didn't mention that mice too much. Are, are there but lots there are of rodents. kinds of mice? There aren't they just little rats? <laughs> but they're rodents. Mm, yeah. They're rodents, and they also they, they're also a danger to health. Mm -hmm. And they constantly urinate and defecate wherever they feed and wherever they are. Mm -hmm. So if they're feeding on your, your food, they're leaving their <laughs> they're leaving their remains there. And they yeah they 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 will leave in your house. Most rats live outside of mm -hmm. the house and come inside. Sometimes they can build nests, you know, in the attic or sure. in other areas. M most of them are coming into your house, and they can travel quite a long distance. They can have a nest in your yard or or close to a creek and come inside your house. If 
they, they can come in through very small spaces, one yeah, fourth of an amazing. inch. That's amazing. That's truly, you know, I, I, I was, Michael uh, Botha tried to explain that to me many, many programs ago. How in the world can this thing that looks about as big as a softball get under a little door with a quarter inch clearance? Well, the head, mm-hmm. it's triangular with a pointed snout. Mm-hmm. So they fit in their snout first. Yep. And... I guess they know if the snout goes. If or the if, snout it, it, goes, it, it, the whole body goes. Yeah, it just, yeah. They just kind of squeeze through it. Um, and Yikes. They get, so sealing your house up underneath the door, like mm. the door entrances, mm. um, they can get in there, windows, sometimes small, small holes where the electric cables come in mm-hmm. or pipes. That's enough for them to enter. Okay, now if if you need to know more about that, uh, the, I'm I'm pretty soon. Uh, if, if do you need to know more about that, I, I think it's kind of important that you either get online or, or make a call. And I want to talk about what I said a moment ago, and that's the embarrassment factor. People don't like to admit. They certainly don't want their na- their their family and friends to know that they have a rat issue or even cockroach issue. I mean, I do know that if we could isolate one thing that drives people the most crazy in Hawaii outside of termites eating their houses, it must be roaches. <laughs> well, <laughs> no need to be embarrassed yeah, about roaches yeah. because in Hawaii there's roaches everywhere. But um, it is possible to manage them inside your house yeah. and outside your house with baits, with sprays, and through sanitation. Yeah, I think also, and that's one thing that I know that Michael pounds in there, and one of the takeaways that a lot of your homeowners will get when you've had an inspection is you've got a food source. Yes, uh, they need yeah. they need food, yeah. they need mm-hmm. water. So you need mm-hmm. to limit them their access to food yeah. and water. You know, there's one more that, and I, this is a pet peeve of mine. I want to ask you about I know it's kind of blindsiding you, but I want to ask you about this thing. It's called the Egyptian meal moth. Okay. You know, and I actually uh, texted Michael both a picture of one that I found in our kitchen, and we thought we got rid of them. What are those things, anyway? I mean, they seem to like grains and rice and all of that kind of stuff. Um, are they a problem? For sure. Mm-hmm. They're a problem. They'll feed on your stored food and yeah. your grains and your pastas and your seeds, etc. Do you know that they can get inside a jar? Oh, yes. Yeah, they, I couldn't they believe They need it. a very, very yeah. small yeah. entrance, yeah. but they can't. They can't enter into a vacuum sealed jar. Okay. Like if you have a jar of pasta sauce right, or, some, right, or, right. or seeds and they're vacuum sealed before mm-hmm. you open it, they can't yeah. get in. But into bags and into open jars, they can get in. You know, here's the problem. We, you know, because everybody tries to save money, right? And they buy, say, a, a big bag of rice. Oh, yeah. And, and they're not going to use it. It's going to take several you know, weeks or maybe even months before they use it all. Isn't that, that's a food source right there. That's a food chain. Ah, for sure. Mm. And sometimes already the, it comes infected from the, from, from the place where you bought the food mm-hmm. or even from the storage facility. There could be eggs and they hatch. And Are there problems with eating those things if they're in your food? Not a big problem. Mm. They're not a, um, the, the, not a big problem, but they leave a lot of webbing in the food mm. and feces and puke and i think most people don't want to eat that no of course uh and and i i guess if if the short question is there is no answer but we have an awful lot of pests to control that's (laughs) why that's why now a lot of people usually they usually perceive because before it was sandwich oil termite and pest control and i know that termites dropped out of the uh out of the slogan but it's still a very 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 important part of your business talk a yes. little bit about the new rage about the orange and and whatnot instead of the tenting uh and and i understand that even in the industry there's some changes being made in that area yes well tenting um gets rid of all the termites mm-hmm. in the house you know Fumigation. It does not prov- provide, though, any future control. There's no residual. Okay. It only kills what there at the moment. Um, Which makes most people happy. That's the panacea, right? But yeah. But the minute you, the, the minute the treatment's over, new ones can here come they come in. again. Right. That's yeah, right. Yeah. New ones can come in. Um, there are treatments that can that can take care of local problems. There could be a beam or 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 
any part of your house that could have a local, uh, you know, local termite colony in that area. And there are products that we can apply to kill them. Mm -hmm. There's some that work like baits in which if they feed on a powder that is put into the kick out hole, they carry that powder into the um, into the colony and it brings down the whole colony, kills the whole colony. Orange oil is a contact mm -hmm. poison. So the they need the, every single termite needs to be touched. It needs to be uh, ah, in, in contact with mm -hmm. the orange oil for 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 them to die they, but there's also baits that can be used mm -hmm. um so there's more th and there's also termite protection N not all termites are the same there's the sure. ground termites there's the dry wood termites for the ground termites there's a system called centricon in which you put baits on the ground and they find the bait carry it to the colony brings down the yeah. colony it will protect your house from ground termites i can tell you something as a firm believer in that even though i'm looking at some other things with michael and with sandwich isle sandwich isle has been taking care of our home for a long time and the centricon thing is the real deal and then i i think and this is to do with now marisol the training that you're doing as a certified board entomologist is the people that come out to the house are qualified they're insured they're bonded they're licensed they know what they're doing and that if that bait system it really Really, really matters. But the big question is, I know everybody asks this. I live in a very rainy area. Does it is I don't, but I mean somebody else said I live in a very rainy area. Does the central con system still work even in a wet place? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Um it, it it's it is effective for years and years. Mm -hmm. Um so yes, you know it doesn't degrade with the rain and it doesn't really leach. And if the wood, if the bait gets wet, yeah the the termites even like it better. Isn't they like it gnarly. They like it the moldier, the uglier it looks, mm -hmm. the more the termites like it. Now, explain how that works, because obviously uh, you have these inspection stations. I have in my yard, I think about 30 of them around the house, right? Maybe maybe more, I don't know. But um, what's the object of them? I mean, that's a bait, and and, 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 and he eats it. But does he also bring some back to his uh, to his? To his family. But yeah, um, termites are social insects. Mm -hmm. um, they have a society. They have the king, the queen, and workers, soldiers, etc. And is that similar to bees and similar to uh, similar yeah, similar yeah, concept yeah. Mm -hmm. to bees and to ants, ants yeah. etc. They have a society, and they they believe in community. They're not. They don't really. They don't fight for the individual, mm -hmm. but they are they are for the community. So if you kill one individual termite, you really haven't done anything. Yeah, I know. You know, because I mean, that queen can good. produce. It feels good. It feels slap good. It, slipper, it but, feels you know. good, but nothing else. You have yeah. not really done anything. You need to bring down the whole community, the yeah. whole society, the whole colony. You have to bring down. Yeah, and I, I think that's fascinating. And I'm, we, we will, in the very near future, dedicate an entire program to that. Because termites, uh, it's like Michael, both of the founder and president, says, there's, there's two types of houses. One, the houses that have termites and the houses that are going to get them. I, I think I, I want to give sort of a parting message to people today. What to take away from meeting Dr. Marisol Quintanilla and finding out a little bit more about Sandwich Isles. Um, it's, it's not just your, your house's value of a termite eating your wood and causing you financial damage. But what's the real reason behind pest control about, about just good for health, not just for value in your home, but good for your health? Well, like, like rodents, mm -hmm. they are dangerous. They, they can transmit diseases. They will feed on your food when you're not looking. Leave their feces and their urine there. You probably don't like that. Yep. Um, mosquitoes. They can transmit diseases besides being a horrible nuisance pest. Roaches, um, they they can cause allergies. Yep. And besides, they're feeding in your food and defecating, etc. In other words, we have a lot to talk about coming up, don't we? Yeah. So <laughs> it, it, there's a lot of yeah. there's a lot of things that affect your health yep. and affect your well your quality of life. So living pest free 
It's a beautiful experience. There you go. Dr. Marisol Quintanilla, thank you for being with us today. We'll see you again real soon. And folks, if you haven't figured this out, you need an annual inspection of your property, especially for termite control. Do it before it's too late. There's two ways to do this. You go to sandwichisle.com. That's www.sandwichisle.com. Or easier yet, call them up. Their slogan is at Sandwich Isle, you can expect more and you get it. And that's going to be literally a guarantee that we give to you. And call them up at 456-7716. 4567716 Well, that's our show for today. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. And if something is bugging you, jump online and get debugged at sandwichisle.com. That's sandwichisle.com.